Welcome to the internet, live from the Marriott Library at the University of Utah. This is the Red Line Podcast. I'm your host, several raccoons in a trench coat, and these are my co-hosts... Kyle Holland and... Alex Fielder. Today we're concluding the Cost Snake series with an examination of why transit costs so much more in Anglophone North America than almost anywhere else. We'll talk contracting, institutional knowledge, and more after the news. do 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 <laughs> that is not a good representation of the news. Cat Metro in Austin has finally officially confirmed Dottie Watkins as their new president and CEO after Ms. Watkins took up both roles on an interim basis in June of 2022. She will be the leader responsible for spearheading Cat Metro's ambitious Project Connect expansion plan and replace former leader Randy Clark, who left to take the helm at WMATA. Hopefully, Ms. Watkins will be able to keep Project Connect on track, and we wish her luck, because she will need it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all I got. There isn't. Sometimes there's not a good news week. There's like, you know, no. Nothing opened, nothing crashed. Hard happened, yeah. 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 Sometimes that's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we get yeah. to learn about the CEO of Cat Metro. Maybe Chief, next week. <laughs> Chief Budget Wrangling Officer. Yeah, maybe next week the MBTA will catch on fire again. <laughs> again. Yep. Yeah, probably. I mean, that's been like, you know, in the news like three times, I think, since we started the podcast. I think so. Yeah, that sounds about mm-hmm. right. So, before we begin, I need to credit the people who are responsible for most of the work this episode is based on. The wonderful folks over at the Transit Cost Project, based out of NYU, are doing groundbreaking work in this field and helping advocates, officials, and electeds alike understand how we can get construction costs under control for a better future. Also, Elon Levy, who has been doing this, like, same thing and screaming about it for, like, 12 years. So, thanks, Elon Levy. Woohoo! Let's add some more screaming to the cacophony. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Uh, so, basically, there's no sugarcoating it. American transit construction costs are among the highest in the world. Let's go. Woo, American number one. USA, finest. number one. Yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, if you account for the percentage of our transit projects that are tunneled, the United States is by far the most expensive market to build rapid transit in, period. So, moving on to some data. An average U.S. rail rapid transit project costs somewhere around $520 million per mile, including light rail and heavy rail. And there are only five countries where it is more expensive to build rail rapid transit than the United States. These, those being the United Kingdom, Singapore, Qatar, Hong Kong, and New Zealand. The difference between the United States and other countries listed is that all of them are building projects that are over 80% tunneled, while projects in the United States are, in aggregate, only about 37% tunneled. Which and m- also some of them are massively more urban. See Hong yeah. Kong. Like we're talking like these projects are like Hong Kong, London, Auckland, you know, Singapore. And then Qatar is <laughs> just doing dumb crap for well, fun. Ca- yeah, Qatar building a metro for the express purpose of um, mm. the World Cup. <laughs> That's sad. Yeah. And New Zealand is just, are they just doing lots of tunnels? This is their first ever tunnel. That makes and it sense. will carry the only serious suburban rail network in the country. I can see how that could be expensive. Yeah, and also, you know, directly through the CBD of Auckland. I could see how that'll be expensive. Yeah. Good for them. Yeah. So, uh, basically, what this means is that we're paying similarly high costs for transit that shouldn't be as expensive to build. So, we, we pay, like, you know, what it costs to build, like, you know, a French, like, fully tunneled automated metro to build a light rail line. Yep. Because we're incompetent. It's because we're number one. At incompetence. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, apparently number six, but the other ones have excuses. Yeah. We don't. So when I said that the Second Avenue subway was the most expensive piece of subway ever built at over $2.2 billion per kilometer of track, I was not correct. The East Side Access cost nearly $4.5 billion per kilometer, meaning that the new LIRR access to Grand Central costs just under $1.5 million per foot. Are the tracks made out of solid gold? (laughs) At that price, you you might be able to. Um, And this isn't just a New York City problem. Uh, The new San Jose BART extension is projected to cost nearly a billion dollars a mile. Woohoo! 
This kind of like one, under, this, you know, like suburban housing mostly. That's that makes that sane. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and even for a tunnel, it's still too expensive. Yeah, a billion dollars a mile for a tunnel is absurd. So I mean, I get tunneling in New York being expensive because there's lots of crap and you don't know where it is. But it shouldn't be a billion dollars. Well, no. Even and in this New is York. in a more suburban area where there's not that much yeah. stuff and you mostly know where it is. Um, and then even light rail is getting on the fun. The Central Subway in San Francisco also costs nearly a billion dollars a mile. And the Ballard Link in Seattle cost over $600 million per mile, despite being just over 30% tunneled. I think we should get into the rail construction business. I think we should, too. Doesn't sound like a bad endeavor. Like, <laughs> you could make just obscene amounts of money. It's like being a military contractor. Yeah. <laughs> you get all of America. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so from all these statistics, it's very clear that the United States has a serious transit cost problem. Uh, you know... Even projects that should be pretty cheap and are like, you know, a light rail line going an existing rail corridor, for example, the Portland Orange Line, uh, cost $250 million a mile. And this is in a place that already has lots of light rail running in existing Experience, corridors. Experience, yeah, building it. So hmm. there aren't really any, any excuses here. This should be like $50 million a mile, not 250 Easy. Easy. It's just... We should be able to build tunneled heavy rail for two, like $200 million mm -hmm. a mile. Yeah. And here we are slapping down some tracks, rocks, and signals, and trains for $250 million Well, I mean, to be mile. fair, there are like a few vi big viaducts on, on the Orange Line, but nothing that should make it cost $250 million a mile, including the Tilikum Bridge. That should not, not cost... No. In the year of our Lord, 2023, it is not that hard to build a viaduct. Yeah, <laughs> this, this is true. This is something humanity is very experienced at. Yes. Uh, so, noble listener, you may ask, why does all of this matter? Question mark. Well, the more money you spend on a single project, the less able you are to take on multiple projects, which obviously an issue. The United States is in a desperate need of thousands more miles of rapid rail transit so that we can literally save the planet and every extra dollar unnecessarily spent on building things is a dollar that could have been put in something else. Right, so let's say I am building the Second Avenue subway and instead of it costing two billion dollars a mile, it costs one billion dollars a mile. Some suddenly I can build two Second Avenue subways, or I can build the Second Avenue subway and extend the Buffalo Metro and the Rochester subway. You know, or I can build the Second Avenue subway and fix the rest of the subway system. Yeah, yeah. maybe give it a good power wash too. Yeah, yeah. adopt out some of the rats. Yeah, well that might be that, that might, might be, be really difficult. expensive. Yeah. But. yeah. So, like, you know, let's say I'm building a tracks line to Lehigh and it's going to cost $100 million a mile for no reason. If I can do that for $50 million a mile, I can, I can build one to Farmington, Orem too. Instead of just to Lehigh. Ah. Yeah, but wouldn't you just not do that then? And just be like, oh, we save money. Let's do what we planned on. I mean, given UTA's yes that situation, no. that's probably a sane idea. That depends. <laughs> that sort of depends on the politics of the place you're talking about. Because the other thing you have to take into account with high costs is that, you know, taxpayers exist. And mm. when people see their money going towards, like, really expensive for seemingly no the reason projects. Yeah, <laughs> the, the money pit, as the onion said, that sort of lowers support for further transit expansion. Yeah. Mm. Like, like for example, um, the Orange Line probably killed the Southwest Corridor in Portland, like, even more than COVID did, is because people saw, like, wow, that sure cost a lot compared to all the other max lines we built. And Maybe we shouldn't build this one, and also there's a pandemic. And we're not getting anything, like, crazy better for all this extra money. Right, and the Orange Line, you know, deeply underperformed in terms of ridership because TriMet doesn't have a good supporting bus grid. So, What do you, you know. mean? People don't ride buses. Okay, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I'm not even going to dignify that with a response. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, I'm insert transit agency here. And, you know, I think that this sort of phenomenon suggests a really dark future for agencies like Cap Metro in Austin, 
who are building a ten million dollar or a ten billion dollar, you know, twenty eight mile light rail system. Like that's heavy rail costs in most places. You, you get kind of a, a feedback loop here, and you need to have like a critical mass of adequately normally priced projects in order to make people like your system. Yeah. And get guess what? People like your system when it's actually good. Interesting concept. Yeah. UTA yeah. could not relate. <laughs> 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 Look, I love tracks. I love Frontrunner. I like UTA. I think they're trying their best. But by no stretch of the imagination do we have a good transit system in the Greater Salt Lake City metropolitan area. I mean, we could. It wouldn't be that hard. Okay, but we don't. <laughs> yeah, and we just sit around waiting for ridership to grow on trees. Yeah, magically, <laughs> and then we're going to make fare free, and that will solve all of our ridership problems. And our financial problems, oh, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Definitely will not create any financial problems in the future when we are unable to recoup. Anyway, um, <laughs> so this raises the question, why are transit building costs in the United States so high? cost snake sound. Uh, oh no, we've been bitten by the great of North American cost snake. Yes, and the first, you know, uh, fang in the mouth of the great American cost snake <laughs> is the National Environmental Protection Act of 1970, which was a federal act designed to hold the federal government accountable for its action towards the environments. Okay, I'm going to lead with I like the concept of an environmental impact study. As a just third party, just private citizen, I like being able to look at this one really large document that tells me anything and everything I might want to know about a future project instead of okay, digging for press releases. But why do you need an environmental impact study for a light rail line, Kyle? What possible impact on the environment could a light rail line have? You've got a list like you need to acquire this much and this much property. It's going to cost this this much to build for these reasons. You're going to have to do these wetland mitigations. Right, but what if it doesn't go to a wetland? Then Tracks does not touch any wetlands. Like I said. Tracks does not touch anything that could be damaged by it. I like that. But we still had to do a 10 billion page environmental impact study that took two years for no reason. Like I said, I like the concept of the IES. So, originally, NEPA required EISs uh, for large government actions that would have a broad impact on the environment, like building a dam, you know, something like that. But 50 years of uh, studies and lawsuits have turned EISs into something that is required for basically any government project involving building anything. Again, this could be nice. Like the city's ninth south project, they gave all us, the people, a very nice and beautiful map rendering of exactly what every last bit of it's going to look like. But that's not so much an environmental impact study as a we built the thing, we're going to build this thing <laughs> document. Exactly. So we're, we're kind of taking it like 50, maybe 100 or 200 steps too far. Yeah, it doesn't... I see the point of it for like dams and big stuff that's in the broader protected environment. But I, I do agree it's a bit much. It's too thorough. It's sometimes. way too yeah. thorough. Yeah, the current EIS system is very broken. It requires transit projects, which are almost always a slam dunk for the environment, to undergo <laughs> the same long, tenuous, 10,000 pages of research nonsense that fuel refineries and superhighways have to go through. And then it gets worse because in California they also have the, <laughs> <laughs> of California. They also have the Ca California Environmental Quality Act, known as CEQA, uh, which imposes even more stringent regulations on transit projects and basically everything else. It's not the only state where this is the case. Yeah, and CEQA, resorts ca CEQA reports cause cancer. You get it. <laughs> <laughs> everything causes cancer. Uh, light rail vehicles cause cancer, are known to cause cancer in the state of California. <laughs> 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 Only in California. Yeah. 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 So. Just make sure you stay on uh, heavy rail only in California. <laughs> mm. So yeah. don't be riding the SAC RT or the San Diego trolley. Yeah. So maybe instead of EISs that take two years to do and can derail a project if enough people decide to start lawsuits and drain the budget, instead Draper. of that we should have Dra like... <laughs> Why do you think that the Draper line took longer than all the other front lines lines to open... 
the spoiler NIMBYs. alert: NIMBYs suing about environmental impacts. Oh no! Not putting a train in an existing rail corridor. That will have a big impact on the environment. Don't you agree? Huge, huge, yeah. immeasurable. Anyways, mm-hmm. public engagement. Good. Uh, maybe. We're not to public engagement yet. That's oh, the oh, next okay. one. Sorry. Um, maybe the EIS should take like two months. Maybe unless it's for some like maybe. Here's a thought yeah. for good things that are good for the environment, <laughs> like a solar farm or a light rail line or, I don't know, something else. Uh, environmental impact studies should be short and easy. And for bad things like freeway expansions and refineries and, I don't know, slant drilling, <laughs> environmental impact studies should be long and hard. I feel like that would be difficult to accomplish. Well, there's a couple of ways you can attack this. Like, A, you could make it so you only have to study things that you actually have a chance at causing. For example, wetlands. If you don't touch any wetlands, just that section doesn't even yeah, need to UT be in Yeah, UT doesn't there. have to spend $50,000 on a study to see if, like, seagulls will be affected by a light rail line. Look oh. at wetland map. Train does not touch wetland. Done. And then, second of all, you can look at the positive environmental impacts a thing might have, like the externalities, like a train will reduce air pollution, and an air oil pollution. refinery What's will increase air pollution, and use that to say if your project does good things, then you can have less work, and if it does bad things, you can have more work. Yeah. Uh, Classic government move, regulate and tax things we don't like, subsidize and not be as hard on things we do. Seems fair enough. In a word, carrots and sticks. <laughs> um, number two, Fang. NIMBYism. <sighs> Remember all those NEPA lawsuits you were talking about? Yeah, well, America has one of the worst NIMBYism problems in the whole of the developed world. These EISs facilitate just anybody suing the government just because they don't like the thing. Basically. Um, Not because there's, like, a legitimate serious problem with the thing. Like, it's going to kill every frog in the state or well, whatever. Like, the purple line in Maryland, which is going to connect, like, you know, four of the Washington Metro suburban lines as, like, a like a yeah. sort of hat, like a quarter ring line, uh, got delayed for, like, four years because suburbanites in one particular neighborhood tried to sue them over an invertebrate that did not exist in that neighborhood. Hmm. Like... This is the degree to which NIMBYism is, like, able to affect anything they want in the current day, as long as they're rich and white. That's a good point. This is interesting here, because in a lot of, like, legal situations, like, I don't know, suing a normal person over a normal thing, (laughs) you have to have, like, some strong standing to do so. And if the judge says, that doesn't look legit, or you have no actual interest in this, they can just laugh you out of the room, that you don't even have to go into the actual lawsuit. But that does not appear to be the case here. Maybe leave environmental issues up to environmental yeah. lawyers. Yeah, like maybe if you're an environmental lawyer, you're allowed to sue the government about insert random environmental thing. Yeah. Um, and this can have impacts on design. Like, for example, in Toronto, they were going to do GASP, a viaduct Ooh, for part of their subway that extension. That might be cost effective. Ooh, terrible. Ooh. That, yeah, I know. Cost effective design. And they weren't going to, you know, so. But you can then, sue the government then, because you don't like But how then it looks. all of these NIMBYs in like a single subdivision that it was going to go by teamed up to sue the Canadian government over it. I don't. And then to avoid being sued, the Ontario government simply changed the entire design of the extension to put it all massively underground and then. You know, you have to do underground stations, so that adds additional cost, and they have to be deep, and yada, yada, yada. Design decisions compound costs when you make a bad design decision. So, I don't like how this looks should not be a valid standing to derail a project. But it's bad for the environment. No, it's not. That's literally incorrect. Imagine wanting to make your life considerably worse, (laughs) and make it cost more. Well, yeah, yeah, as long as other people don't get nice things. I'm going to come out with a controversial thing. Community input bad, mostly, because it is almost always just abused by rich and powerful people to get what they want and almost never actually helps the disadvantaged communities that it's meant to help. Community input and engagement, good, but you don't actually have to do anything about it. Yeah. 
I mean, you should do, like, you know, some things if you're, like, actively harming people. But, like, if it's, <laughs> oh, we can't have it here. It's going to destroy the character of our neighborhood by being an elevated viaduct. Just ignore it. You should be able to ignore that because it's stupid and not a valid complaint. So just open the box for people to scream into. And Collect all of the screams. If there are some screams that are legitimate, keep them. If there are screams that are stupid and are going to make everything cost three times as much for no reason, ignore it. Well, and then we can make a process for that, too. Like, scream into the box, close the box, and then if the planners, which... We know planners, you can see them through the cracks of all these of all these public infrastructure projects. They want to do good for their community, so some of these planners might want to read some of that input, and it might influence some like minor design features, like some trees here, a bench here, that sort of thing. And then things like, oh no, this is going to kill um, 200 children with asthma. <laughs> Take that to court, <laughs> yeah, and, maybe the judge, that... and the judge will say... You yeah, have to put it underground because it will kill 200 children with asthma. Yes, and then you can take that to court, and then the judge can read the big complicated rules that says what's serious and what's not, and be like, that's serious, that's not. Yeah. So, anyway, and then as we were discussing, uh, the t- fourth fang, or the third fang is, or wait, is that the fourth fang? That is the third fang, is design. Um Partially because of the first two factors, projects are often massively over-designed. Tunnels are put in places where they don't need to be to avoid NIMBY lawsuits, and politicians who want something pretty to cut a ribbon in front of demand massive edificial stations. Yeah, like, because making setting the groundwork for a transit system for your entire region that will, that will be complete in 30 years and completely save the planet from greenhouse gas emissions and revolutionize everybody's lives is not a good ribbon cutting thing because you can't stand in front of it and cut a ribbon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'm 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 not I I like ornate stations. I I like something okay, unique. Okay, but you build the station and then later you upgrade it to be nice. And there's also I a like difference that. between ornate we paid somebody to paint a mural and ornate it's three times as big as it needs to right, be. Right, like a mosaic. Yeah. Well, that's cheap. Stick a mosaic on the other side of the track so that it looks nice inside hey, the station. Hey, insert local artist like, to make you a stained glass window. We're talking about people building, like, Moynihan train hall level things <laughs> for BRT lines that get a service every 30 minutes. And this is an actual thing in Canada. It's called the Viva BRT. <laughs> and they built these, like, huge, beautiful stations, and then they run a bus through it every 30 minutes. <laughs> Wait, can we get a picture of that? Oh. Oh my goodness. Why is there so much glass? Why are these these big complicated like arches? Huge, beautiful stations. What, and then run an a hour? bus through them every half hour. On yeah. a dedicated bus line? Uh huh. Like full that's basically a full busway there. And they've just yeah. Any plan to convert it to light rail ever? Oh well, probably, but you know. But infinite delay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, other things that are probably a good example of this are, I'm trying to think. Well, first of all, Moynihan itself. Um, <laughs> but second of all, would you say the Austin? Yeah, Austin. Oh, Austin. Yeah, we we're gonna about build that a lot. these stations. And they're gonna have shopping galleries, and they're gonna cost a billion dollars a piece. Mm-hmm. So, mm. yeah, you gotta you gotta build ec- and design economically. Like you can, if you if it needs upgraded to be in like an official station later because it turns out to be really important and billions of people are using it, great, pay to upgrade it then. But when you're first building a line, simple stations are good. Yep. Like, like nobody complains about track stations being bad. And like I like them. <laughs> they're fine. And like obviously, be smart if you think you're going to need an infill station. You can plan for it. Just do it better than UTA does. Um, if you think you're going to need extra land to make a big old station concourse later, just buy it and sit on it. But, like, you you just don't. So just function first, function, fill in the form later. Function, function, function. Pretty does not matter. If it works and it's ugly, it works. If it w- doesn't work and it's pretty, it doesn't work. <laughs> but it's pretty. Yeah. Yeah. I love the temporarily suspended Viva, Viva services. That's funny. Mm-hmm. Suspending a BRT. Yep. So... Ooh, this one has 14-minute uh, service. Wow. 
better than 15 minute service on a fully <laughs> dedicated busway with these like palatial stations I know we get 15 minute service sort of well not on the main branch not like everywhere yeah <sighs> anyway so uh uh, fang number four is contracting um, and as we've discussed before America really likes doing neoliberalism and therefore <laughs> um, especially recently we have decided that we are going to contract everything out all the time sometimes okay. to one company some, sometimes to ten companies this isn't even most of the time to ten though. companies this seems like it's happening everywhere because here at the library yeah. We're getting rid of all of our shop equipment, all of the in-house services we used to do with facilities, and it's just all contracting now. Why? And I imagine it's really expensive, too. Why? But it was a big university, and they already provide all these services. Well, I'm, I'm talking specifically about the library. Why are they doing something different than what the rest of campus is doing? Because I don't reasons. Know. I don't know. Just yeah, I who guess. Who approved this? And we also um, build. You know, we also do these things in kind of a piecemeal manner. Like often we'll have like, you know, X company is contracted to do X thing. X company is contracted to do B thing. Here, this company is going to build a third of the track. This one's going to build a third of the track. This one's going to. Or build a third we do of the an track. even worse thing, and we have one company build everything. And there's no room for <laughs> corruption there. No. So, um, so ten companies, communication breakdowns, mistakes get made. One company, corruption ensues. Yeah, what and do then we do? also we contract out design. You mean the design build process? Yes, we contract out design to contractors instead of building institutional knowledge inside of our transit agencies on how to design transit projects. We pay, we pay private companies to build institutional knowledge and then forget it when we don't use them for anything for five years. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so basically what this means is that we're raising costs, and at the same time, we're not getting any institutional knowledge, and American transit agencies make the exact same mistake over and over and over and over and over again. Because we're not building institutional knowledge. Yeah. Like, there is no... Nobody at UTA remembers how to build a tracks line anymore. Because it's been way too long? Because it's been a long time, and also a lot of the design on front lines was contracted out. So... Are we getting into how we fix it yet? Nope. We still have more fangs. Fang number six, corruption. Because of these contracting practices, the actual costs of building transit are basically unknown to both the public and the government because that's a trade secret. Um, mm. so, so although it is, excuse me, likely that transit project money is being massively misappropriated by contractors, we have no clue how much is being taken or where it's going or where it's being taken from. Great. I feel like the... Because the, because these contractors operate as a black box. You feed money into it and you get something out. I feel like Congress could just snap their fingers and say, hey, all contractors doing work for the government have to provide X transparency re- report. I'm, I'm surprised that's not a thing already. It is, just not for this particular type of contracting. Not for rail contracting? Not for, like, building transit projects or building highways, because that's mm. seen as, like, something you... Anyway... It's complicated. That seems the, the go- stupid. The United States has, like, the largest bureaucracy in the history of humanity, <laughs> and it gets complicated sometimes. There's no corruption in anywhere. Yes. Never has been. Never and then be. Fang, sixth num- of six. Uh, so calling this union's fault is a right-wing hack job of an excuse and should be ignored. It is, however, important to note that treating transit construction as a jobs program and therefore hiring more workers than are strictly necessary can contribute to inflated costs. Just build two cheaper projects instead, and you can hire the same number of guys. Build more transit <laughs> projects than strictly necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's how one should run a jobs program. So, according to, you know, all of the best available sources that I could find, those are the main reasons why American transit costs so much more than it does everywhere else. All right. Time to pull out all these fangs one at, one at a time. Yes. All right. Make a cost snake noise. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's start with EIS reform. Make it easier for projects that are good for the environment and the climate to go through. Because the EIS is simply way too much paperwork. And it costs a lot of money. Because there's too and much paperwork. And it takes paperwork. forever. Like, another thing that this sort of, like, all these things contribute to is it takes a lot longer to build transit Which projects. Which is problematic. Yes, because once again, 
we have 10 years to stop emitting carbon or we're all dead. And we like doing projects sequentially so we can see that one of them is popular and then build another one because that's how funding works. Yeah, so if mm -hmm. it takes us four years to build projects, we only get... I know, wish it took us four years to, to do projects. Well, it sometimes does. If, we, <laughs> if it takes us four years to do projects, we only get two projects done before the end of the world. If it takes us two years to do projects, we get eight pro or, you know... Four eight, projects. Eight, yeah, four projects done before the end of the world. All right. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> so literally just make it less paperwork. Yeah, um, and Joe same. Manchin is actually working on this, which is interesting. Joe, Joe Manchin being good huh. on EIS reform. Yeah, Crazy. which is kind of interesting. Yeah, so, so there is actually work on EIS reform? Yes, and CEQA reform in California as well. So I, it, Is Joe Manchin doing this to be like... He's doing it because of coal, but the net result will be positive because coal is not a good investment anymore. Okay. Now, I, I assumed it would be coal because it's Joe Manchin. <laughs> See recent uh, yeah. Climate Town video, but we're, we're safe because coal will kill itself. Yeah, coal Sweet. is killing itself because it's like a billion times cheaper to just install renewables. Yeah. Good. And you can just use hydro for, and geothermal for baseload. So, <sighs> hydro. I know, but it's uh, a bad idea to tear out a dam at this point. Nuclear. Yeah, but yes. that, I, look, I agree, but nuclear costs way too much to build, and right. we don't have enough. Maybe we should build some institutional knowledge to build it cheaper. Yeah. Again. Well, it only took the, the Nuclear Energy Commission uh, nine years to approve the first small-scale modular reactor for civilian use. <gasps> so I'm sure, you know, have they, by the year 2050, when we have to have no carbon emissions, uh, we'll be fine. Have the U.S. military go march into some middle-of-nowhere desert in Utah and Just, prop up a you know, take the old um, submarines and plug them into the power. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> float, we, them in the, float them in the Great Salt Lake. Yeah. We might get one at Green River. Oh, that's Based. awesome. Yeah, I did a whole report on it. Uh, how big is that? Like out power output? Oh, I have no months. idea. Oh. oh. <laughs> I want to know. It, it's about equivalent to a coal plant yeah. would be oh, in well. Utah. Oh, good. Cool. And also with regard to quantity of paperwork, permitting and zoning are occasionally issues which impact not only transit projects, also housing projects. Um, less paperwork for good things. Next. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as we discussed, reform local input so that it is not so much like if the NIMBYs don't like it, it has to go underground as the NIMBYs don't like it too bad, but it will give 300 kids asthma in this particular place. So we need to do something about it there. Mm -hmm. Yes. So don't give every voice the power to threaten the actual government with like tens of millions of dollars in legal costs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this one is in all caps. Stop contracting out design and construction. Bring back the Works Progress Administration and build institutional knowledge. I want the Federal Department of Building Trains. Yes. yes literally. Please. Literally. It just hops from city, from city to city, from metro area to metro area, and just builds some trains. And or in between as well. With good American union labor and good American steel and whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This would be a very net positive for the economy. Like, yes. let private contractors build private projects. Brightline is showing that there is going to be demand for private rail projects for Stacy and Whitbeck to get their fingers all over. Great. So do that. It's a private project. But if the but government if it, the wants government's to going to own the project, then the government, the government build should it. build it. That yeah. seems pretty straightforward. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, the last one kind of helps with this, but maybe some daylight laws for contractors could help for transit projects so that we are not feeding money into a black box and not knowing where it's going and yep. how it's producing. Yep. Like, you have to shovel $1.5 million into the New York City contractor black box <laughs> to get a foot of track. <laughs> Maybe if we knew what was going on inside the box. I feel like that's a pretty low-hanging fruit compared to some of these other things. Yeah. The trouble is um, There's gonna Citizens be United. Oh. Woo! The worst, the second worst thing that ever happened to this country after the election of Ronald Reagan um, <laughs> allows these companies to, you know, payroll politicians to not reform that sort of thing. <sighs> so This is nope. the job of a company. It's to make as much money as possible. So anyway. No so benefit people. Nope. Well, I mean, look, there are, there are some companies that are, you know, 
well intentioned, and then there are others that are not. Once your company is big this enough, is it's and publicly owned, its function eventually becomes make more money. Yeah. Yeah. Which I mean. That's just how the incentive. Economy is go burr. We do have to have those for you know society to function. So. Yeah. Yeah, but infrastructure construction is maybe not maybe what, not, not one, one of the of best places things, for that yeah. model. Yeah. Uh, so seems to work fine for light bulbs. Yeah, those are my fixes <laughs> for why everything costs so much. Um, and I wrote conclusion quote transit is good money is bad spend less money to get more transit yeah. we need to spend more money to get more transit but also make our use of money more effective so we can get as much bang as possible for our bucks so like don't spend more to get less spend more to get more cool well, that's very agreeable yeah <laughs> yeah so uh, Texas well I guess it depends on which part of Texas but some parts of Texas might say uh, let's spend less to get the same amount. New York might say, let's spend 1.5 times as much to get five times as much. Everybody wins, regardless of your yeah. individual views. The on Buffalo how much Metro money Rail be now has five lines instead of half of one. Yeah. yeah. So everybody wins when stuff costs the normal amount. Mm hmm. Uh, so that's the video. Anybody else have any other notes they want to add? Um, any legal or like congressional solutions for the labor issues, like having way too many people that's, just sitting that's at ladders? that's at a, that's at the state level mostly. Okay. Like when this sort of project is planned, the state's like, we want as many jobs as possible out of this, so we're going to hire so instead of more d- people. doing reform to regulate that out of being an issue, maybe state governments not being competent challenge. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> difficult. <laughs> Well, you see, that's the trouble with the part. Part-time legislatures are another really bad thing we have in this country. <laughs> Don't we pay them f- the amount to be full-time? Not really. Oh. Um, but part-time legislatures are a very bad thing because you are running what is effectively a, con- a small country within a country, and you're only meeting 60 days a year? Well, just hope nothing happens up- outside of that. Yeah. Like Lichtenstein, Unless it's an abortion. Lichtenstein, which is a country of like 30,000 people in the Alps, has a full-time legislature. <laughs> Every state should have a full-time legislature. Some municipalities are even worse with like part-time figurehead yeah, mayors. Yeah, yeah. No. Pay the you, city manager. The government is not a part-time job. Sorry. We have the budget <laughs> to have a full-time whatever. Yeah. It doesn't um, even cost that much to have a full-time legislature. No, it doesn't. I mean, the podcast is part-time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Can, can we bribe them with, like, a pizza party or something? Apparently that works on workers. Yeah. That works on students, too. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, Wait, so... state legislature meets 60 days out of the year. Um, a pool of students meets 305 days, days out of the year and uses the same chairs and has the same legislative power. Who's that? I don't know. Oh, I see. Can I be one of the students? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now we're now we're cooking. Yeah. Uh, it's like not with now we're cooking with induction. <laughs> mm, that's for your lungs and the environment. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Uh, so please remember to like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube, and to follow and give us a rating on iTunes and Spotify. If you like the work we do, please consider becoming a member on Patreon. Patreons get it access to exclusive content, early access to the content we're already making, and some other fringe benefits besides. And speaking of patrons, at $10 a month frontrunner tier, we have Curtis Herring, Mike Christensen, and Phobos2390. And then at $20 a month, but also frontrunner tier, we have Zach Adams. Thank you all. Yeah. At our red line tier, $5 a month, we have Brian Smith, Christopher Whaley, Jacob Whitecotton, and Robert P. Walsh. Blue line tier, we have uh, three dollars a month. We have Just Cause, Alex uh, Dykowski. You'll have to tell me if I'm saying that wrong. Ben Busath, D.J. Will Watkins, Ethan McDonald, Jack Dean, John Heron Gorman, Martin Hecker Martinez, Old Trolley, Scott Harris, and Seth. Yeah, it's a long list. lots of you guys. Thank you all. Yeah, we're yeah. gonna <laughs> have we're gonna start having trouble with these pretty soon if this keeps up. Yeah. We need so. to make, like, a patron song or something. Well, we have to scroll, at least. We, we do have to scroll. got Zach Adams, Curtis Herring, Mike Christensen, Phobos2390, Brian Smith, Christopher Whaley, Jacob Black Cotton, Robert B. Walsh, and Just Causes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Alex Dickelensky, Ben Boussath, DJ Will Watkins, Ethan McDonald, Jack Dean, John Her- Heron Gorman, <laughs> and Martin Hacker Martinez, Old Trolley, Scott Harrison, Seth. That is not the official Patreon song. It, well, that, that's, that's pretty good. I, I, I think, think it's the good. official Patreon yeah. song. So, yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs>